Les habla Pocho Salcedo y damos la bienvenida a nuestra audiencia en Latinoamérica y de costa a costa en los Estados Unidos de Norteamérica y Hawái. Una vez más, explorando con ustedes el ADN de las noticias regionales e internacionales. Hoy vamos a conversar sobre un proyecto esencial para continuar la vida de la civilización humana eh, en una bóveda diseñada para existir 500 años o más, ubicada cerca del Polo Norte, se contiene una colección mundial que preserva como 15.000 años de la historia de la agricultura en forma de más de un millón de paquetes de semillas de plantas de casi 200 lugares distintos de la tierra. Hoy los invitamos a la bóveda de Svalbard. Estaremos allí y también hablaremos con su creador un programa imperdible. Comenzamos presentando al padre de este proyecto, conocido como la bóveda de Svalbard. Morgan Carrington Carey Fowler Jr., welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be with you. El doctor Carrie Fowler es quizás mejor conocido como el padre de la bóveda global de semillas de Balbar. El doctor Fowler propuso la creación de esta instalación ártica y encabezó el comité internacional que desarrolló el plan para su establecimiento. Obtuvo su doctorado en la Universidad de Uppsala, Suecia, con una tesis sobre biodiversidad agrícola y derechos de propiedad intelectual. Es autor y coautor de más de 100 publicaciones y libros. También ha recibido importantes galardones y premios. Kerry, let me ask you a broad question first. You often make the statement that doomsday in agriculture happens every day in increments. What are those things that are you referring to and what are the resulting implications? Mm -hmm. I, I think that probably every day we lose a little bit of um, genetic or agricultural diversity in our in our major food crops. And that's the diversity. Those are the traits that we might need in the future to keep those very crops productive, um, particularly in a climate changing world. So um, that means that uh, a farmer can decide not to grow a particular variety again in the future and therefore not save the seeds. And that might be a unique variety that has a unique trait that we'll never see again. But, you know, scientists have also collected a lot of seeds and uh, stored them for conservation purposes in seed banks. And uh, I'm sorry to say we lose diversity in the seed banks as well, just like uh, sometimes a librarian would lose a book in a library. It seems that the Svalbard Vault, um, of which you were um, the creator and conceived the idea, uh, many refer to you as the father of the project, is an indispensable part of deflecting humanity's food insecurity that you just uh, uh, indicated. You see the vault also as a library of life, but you also realize it's an incomplete catalog. How is that gap going to close, if ever? You know, uh, to be honest, I don't know if it's going to close. Um, it's really going to take, um, frankly, programs like yours <laughs> educating people to the importance of closing the gap. And the gap is, is um, a gap in two different ways. One is, yes, we do need to, um, uh, the, the seed vault functions as a backup of a plan B, if you will, for a regular seed bank. So we do need all the seed banks in the world to deposit a copy of what they have in Svalbard for safekeeping, just in case something happens to their seed bank. So that's one gap. Um, and the second gap is there, there are many um, crops that are, you might want to say they're minor crops, um, crops that are very, uh, that might be popular regionally or locally, but are not um, major crops on the international stage. And for the most part, those crops have had less um, investment. You don't have so many companies that are involved in that. You don't have so many plant breeders. And that means that collections really haven't been made for those crops. 
uh, very much. And I think we need to be collecting those and conserving those because I believe in the future, some of those, those minor crops are going to become major. And it's possible that some of the major crops will become minor. So we need to keep all of these options alive for the future. Um, Nigeria, Colombia, Mexico, the USA, Peru, Ethiopia, uh, Syria, the Philippines, uh, all of them and many others have research centers. But you have a great story of co collaboration with uh, Syria and the events that happened in Aleppo. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. I think that this exemplifies the role of the vault in an excellent well, way. Um, thank you. It, it's really a story of, of heroes in, in Syria. Uh, Syria was the home uh, to the International Center for Agricultural Research in Dry Areas. That's a mouthful. Uh, we, we call it ICARTA. Uh, it's a major international center uh, for uh, research in crops for dry arid areas. And it was a major plant breeder for a number of crops of uh, wheat, barley, lentils, chickpeas, and uh, lathyrus or grass pea, a major uh, plant breeder for that region, for the Mideast. Um, it, it was not a national facility, international facility. And when the trouble started associated with Arab Spring, um, I can remember getting on the phone with a, uh, the fellow who was the director general of that center, happened to be a good friend of mine from, um, from the old days. And um, I mentioned what was happening. And uh, he said to me that, well, yes, there's some problems in Libya and uh, maybe there will be some problems in Egypt, but those problems will never come to Syria. Um, because Syria is really locked down. The political control is very tight. And I, I agreed. I said, I thought, no, it's, it was unlikely that there would be any similar trouble in Syria. Um, but I remember telling him, uh, but, you know, just in case, we should get a copy of your seeds from your seed bank, one of the biggest and one of the best in the world, up to Svalbard for safe keeping in the seed vault. And he laughed, and he said... Well, Carrie, I guess that's what the seed vault is about, isn't it? It's about just in case. And I thought that was the best description of the seed vault I had ever come across. Everybody understands it. So he said, okay, we'll get it up there just in case. And uh, we went about trying to multiply those seeds so we could take a portion of them and send them to, to uh, basically to the North Pole. And um, before we got to the end of that process, um, the situation had changed in Syria, and there was a lot of fighting. Um, we had to really scramble at the end, and um, at the end, I think the last, uh, we, we had to get trucks to go over the border um, to transport the last part of the seeds out. And I think even now, you can go on the internet and find um, small videos of some of the fighters standing in front of the main research building there, where I've uh, been many times um, and, and stood myself for those kind of photos you, you take with everybody after you've had a meeting. <laughs> um, and, but there they are with their guns firing them in the air. Um, one of the things that I think is, uh, is very poignant to me about that story is that the, um, the international staff had to flee. It was absolutely not safe for them. But the national staff, they didn't really have anywhere to go. And um, they stayed and they came into the office and they came, they kept the gene bank running <laughs> as long as possible. And they were really responsible for, for safeguarding those seeds. So it's a number of people whose names I don't know um, who saved some of the most precious resources on earth because this collection that they were safeguarding was a collection that uh, of, of wheat and barley and lentils and chickpeas that that had a lot of um, uh, and will have a lot of value in the future for for breeding a heat tolerant and drought tolerant varieties of those crops. So this was an international resource um, precious to the entire world, and uh, you know a small group of people uh, helped a little bit by the seed vault uh, saved that that collection. That is an amazing story. Uh, there's so much that uh, um, 
happened before the sea vault uh, started and during uh, its uh, construction today and probably in the future. So what will it look like in your view handing over agriculture in general terms in a better shape to the next generation? Well, you know, we, we don't know what's coming. Um, we, we don't have a crystal ball to tell us what the future is going to bring. And um, I know a lot of people get very excited about what kind of agricultural system you have. Is it organic or is it, does it have chemical fertilizers? Does it have GMOs or not GMOs? I don't know the answer to that. It seems to me like we're probably going to have multiple different kinds of agricultural systems well into the future. So um, early in my life, I, I made the decision that, uh, you know, I wanted to do something positive that had a good chance for being positive in the future. And that seemed to me to be saving all of the options. Um, there's a, a little saying that a, uh, an American conservationist um, said many years ago, and he observed that um, uh, the first rule of successful tinkering is to save all the pieces. So if you don't know how the puzzle is going to turn out, you at least have to save all the pieces of the puzzle in case you might, might need them in the future. And um, I think that's what uh, those of us who are involved in conserving crop diversity, we're just trying to make it possible that people in the future have all the options available to them and, and uh, are not circumscribed by having lost that diversity. We are talking about uh, the essence of how our civilization has lived and how it, it will sustain the future. Um, uh, ch changes in the climate uh, at all levels uh, across the world just exacerbated the challenge. However, I don't see uh, too many or actually very few uh, governmental initiatives towards this crisis. It will seem that um, either we are ignoring or we're not aware and it is on the shoulders of individual organizations across the world. Why is that? Well, I unfortunately, I think you're right. Um, part, part of it is, uh, and, and I think governments have miscalculated, by the way. I think people are more concerned about this issue than, they, uh, than governments realize. But, um, you know, historically, it has been a lot easier to get the general public concerned about saving the whales and the seals and the... Um, the rhinos and things like that, um, charismatic um, large animals that you can look into the eyes of, that's a little bit more emotional than looking into the eyes of wheat. <laughs> um, and, and also I think we've, we've been a little bit misled in the discussions we've had about endangered species and about extinction. We've made it into a numbers game so we, we say to ourselves, well, there are only so many of this kind of uh, this species of whale or this type of tiger. And it's almost as if um, very fatalistically, we wait for the last one to die. And then we say, well, it's gone, it's extinct. But in fact, um, and if you apply that kind of numbers game to agriculture, you don't get concerned at all because you can go to a farmer's field and you can see thousands of of maize plants or th hundreds of thousands of wheat plants. So you say there's no problem here. But really extinction is, is um, a process, it's not an event. Extinction happens when a species loses the ability to evolve successfully to a different climate or a different environment. And what does it need to evolve? What's the raw material of evolution? Well, uh, Charles Darwin laid that out and started to lay it out in his first chapter of his book, um, Origin of Species, which was on domesticated plants and animals. Um, the first, the, the raw material for evolution is diversity. So if we really want um, our agricultural crops to survive, they have to adapt, they have to evolve. And therefore we must uh, conserve that genetic diversity, the variability within those different crops. And that's what I think um, 
many governments haven't seen. And the second thing I'll just point out very quickly is they haven't realized what an incredible cost benefit is involved in actually saving this diversity. How many government programs um, can make more money than they, than they lose, than they spend? And for governments to conserve seed diversity in agricultural crops and to use that in plant breeding um, has a it has a cost benefit ratio that you just wish you could go on the stock market and get, <laughs> but it's not available to you and me, but it is available in this field. They're gonna make more than they spend. And um, maybe as soon as governments figure that out, they'll be spending a lot more on this field. Bueno, y tomamos una pequeña pausa y retornamos muy pronto. Hay acciones cotidianas para ayudar a prevenir la propagación de enfermedades respiratorias. Lávese las manos. Evite el contacto cercano con las personas enfermas. Evite tocarse los ojos, la nariz y la boca. Quédese en casa cuando esté enfermo. Cúbrase al toser o estornudar. Limpie y desinfecte de manera frecuente los objetos que toca. Para obtener más información, visite cdc.gov diagonal COVID-19. Este mensaje es gentileza de la National Association of Broadcasters y de esta estación. Gracias por esperarnos. Aprovechamos esta oportunidad para saludar a dos de nuestras estaciones en los Estados Unidos. Al Canal 5 Portland Media Center en el estado de Maine, en la costa este, y a DATV en Dayton y otras ciudades unidas al sistema de cable en el estado de Ohio. Gracias por hacernos parte de su programación. This project, um, I have asked anyone, say we're doing this, and I always ask how much you think it costs. And everybody's in the hundreds of millions of dollars, you know? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's when good. I say $9 million, it's almost like, what? Yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. yes. The other thing that uh, um, really um, took me by surprise is that when you conceive a project of the scale that you are running, um, you think that hundreds and hundreds of people are involved, but maybe they are, but your organization, your team is not an army. It's almost like a SWAT team, you know? It's true. And, it, was, it was very small. It was very small. And I think um, the moment that I realized that we could actually pull it off was actually um, not thinking about the design, the location or anything like that. It was the management plan. <laughs> how are we really going to manage this? Because I knew if we didn't have a good management plan, we'd have to have a lot of people right. and it cost a lot of money and the people would make stupid human mistakes that would ruin everything. So I spent a lot of time just thinking of how to simplify, how to make it as simple as, you know, we have this phrase in English, I'm sure you know it, um, that you need to make these kinds of things foolproof Right. Because sooner or later, a fool will be running it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we tried. You know, talking uh, this morning with Asmund, and he uh, talked about the vault itself. It, it is um, such an utilitarian design. And, you know, I immediately, Im initially, I thought there were like, a, you know, a team of people that were there. All the time, my gosh, when, yes. you know, it, it's nothing like that, but it's very effective, you know? Yeah, we had, we wanted to make it very simple. So um, sometimes people seem to get disappointed if, if uh, they ask me what it's like. And I say, well, it's a tunnel. It's just, <laughs> a, it's a tunnel in the mountain. Yeah, <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so. To talk about what it is to talk to governments across the world for them to share the seeds, you know, because uh, there are many things that the governments think uh, before they say yes. And sometimes it takes a long while, I imagine, to convince uh, governments to participate. Yes, and, and you know, that, um, that observation of yours is, uh, is one that not many people make. And it's, uh, it's extremely important because um, I remember when we 
when we opened the seed vault and even shortly thereafter, people would say, well, um, do you have do you have seeds from China? Do you have seeds from Japan? Do you have seeds from what they would name a country? And I would say, no. Oh, well, why not? And, you know, I had to give some thought to that and really how to explain it. Because I knew that I had been on the phone with every one of those depositors to for hours to talk to them about why this was important, how it was going to work, what their rights were, I mean, answer all their questions. But um, the surprise was not that some countries didn't deposit on day one. Um, it would have been a gigantic surprise if all the countries had deposited on day one. Now, now that would have really required an explanation. <laughs> <laughs> The opposite didn't, because I, I used to tell people, I said, you know, I have very good friends in Brazil, and I have very, and I have some very good friends in China uh, and Japan. Um, I just want you to imagine for a moment China and Brazil, and the kind of conversation you would have with those two people. <laughs> <laughs> And how quickly they would want to work. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And I said, for a Brazilian, it could be that next week is uh, is is going slowly. <laughs> but for Chinese, ten years from now is going quickly. <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> and you just have to, you know, in Italian they say con calma with calmness. Con calma, yes, yes. <laughs> so, Okay, in closing, um, uh, reading a little bit about your uh, uh, focus on this project, um, I see that you were inspired as a young man spending time in your grandma's farm. Um, the crisis of 9-11 brought some new ideas to you and I'm sure many things in between. What do you wish you knew at the beginning of this journey that you know today that would have made this project and the things that you're working uh, for um, a lot uh, uh, more uh, productive, uh, will move at a faster speed. Uh, what are those things that you were not aware of? Oh my, I, I'm not sure you have time for that, but... <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was a young man. I was headstrong. I thought I could uh, make a meaningful contribution in two months. That was 40 years ago. <laughs> so I made some miscalculations along the way. I, you know, I tell young people today to be patient. Um, and I tell them that you don't have to be a genius to do something worthwhile or interesting um, in, in your life. Uh, you just have to keep at it. You have to be persistent. And Ideas, you know, such as for the seed vault, they don't float down out of the heavens. Um, they result from just uh, persistent hard work and taking one step after the next. And and it, truly, anyone can do that. Well, there is one, so many amazing things about this project, but one that I can mention, uh, and I think it's in the heads of everyone, uh, nobody can believe uh, the amount of money, little amount of money that was invested to generate this opportunity for everybody across the world. Uh, when I hear it's, uh, it was $9 million, you know, it's not a small fraction uh, uh, of money, but comparatively to anything any government in any country spends, it is, you cannot even quantify. And um, so um, you're right. It is a concept, you made it durable because you're thinking about 500 years or, or longer. Uh, you're preserving a history of uh, uh, so many uh, thousands of years of uh, agriculture. And uh, you did it uh, because uh, you were persistent and you saw how to present a solution. And we are so grateful for that. Kerry, um, it's been an honor um, talking to you. Uh, how can 
us as uh, regular citizens can help your project and projects like this uh, to prosper and to grow and and to be uh, the focus uh, center of our attention. Well, I you know I think work in this area is. Uh, uh, can be complemented by many other kinds of activities of people striving towards justice and food security. Um, but one thing certainly that your listeners can do is simply spread the story again, just like you're doing, and I, I hope they do. And still wearing to keep this visible and to make it to see it growing. Uh, it is amazing. The skill, the set of the skills necessary to do this. Um, you know, a brilliant idea, but also a brilliant execution. Although it's very painful, I'm sure uh, there have been very difficult times, and um, but uh, it is worth it. And thank you, Carrie, again. Oh, thank you very much. La bóveda de Svalbard. Es un proyecto vital para asegurar la seguridad alimentaria de la civilización, la continuidad de la agricultura desafiada con la aceleración del cambio climático y la disminución de la diversidad genética que se ve disminuida a diario. Es una antesala uh, en una presión nunca antes eh, vista y experimentada eh, sobre la producción de alimentos agrícolas eh, y la flora y la fauna en general. Esta es una respuesta importante que solo ha requerido la inversión inicial de 9 millones de dólares y la decisión de un puñado de científicos apoyados por Noruega que encendieron la chispa a nivel mundial. Hasta una nueva oportunidad cuando juntos una vez más exploremos el ADN de las noticias. Gracias. Gracias.